got to. Hi. Terrific. Hi. Hello there. Hi, Thank Jay. you for joining us, Mary. It's really a great pleasure to have you. Uh, a lot of people outside Australia may not know much about your extraordinary background. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you have the courage where so many other people in establishing media don't to stick up for WikiLeaks? My, my admiration of WikiLeaks goes back to the early days in the pre-Iraq um, logs and pre-Iraq video days when uh, there, there were a number of revelations and I thought um, as someone who worked in news, uh, this is just extraordinary. Here's this ingenious and courageous website that's provided a way for whistleblowers to upload anonymously. And, uh, it, and whistle, I mean, there are many whistleblowers and they don't get the um, uh, support from the public that they should be getting. Whistleblowers. Uh, enhance our democracy. They're working for us. And yet, when the crunch comes, they're unsupported and the minimum price they pay is they lose uh, their job and they become unemployable. Um, and the consequences can be far greater for them personally. So it seemed to me this was absolutely brilliant and, and a great tool for anyone working in journalism because here you were going to have access to factual information uh, to the truth. And that's the biggest struggle in journalism. And that's the biggest service of journalism uh, to enable citizens to make their own decisions based on uh, truth. What were your colleagues saying back then in the early days, your colleagues in television news and, and, and print media, you must have known some of those as well, yeah. about WikiLeaks? And what are they saying now? Uh, well, mm, yes. In the early days, there was admiration mixed with a little bit of envy, I think. Um, you know, who do they think they are, you know? Then they got too big for their boots because they became heroes to too many people. Um, and I think in the end, uh, the media largely has abandoned WikiLeaks. And uh, I, I, that's something that I think is uh, unforgivable um, because attacks on WikiLeaks are really attacks on the media uh, in general. And um, unfortunately, those attacks can be successful because the people that are pursuing WikiLeaks, the institutions that are pursuing WikiLeaks, can convince the rest of us that it's really just about them when, when it isn't and it shouldn't be and we should be standing together. Do you think there are any political reasons for why they've abandoned Assange, the establishment media? Um... I think it's just easier to deal with, you know, even if there aren't political reasons, and I'm sure in some uh, circumstances there are political reasons, and in other circumstances I think it's just a failure of uh, imagination and a, a failure to engage imagination and a failure of responsibility. Sometimes when things are difficult to deal with, uh, it's easier to not think about them. And that goes for journalists as well as um, the rest of us. You know, I've, I've been in establishment media many, many years like yourself, and I've seen a change in the attitude of individual journalists uh, in their relationship with the public and their relationship with government in particular. There was a sense, I think, years ago, and I'm not just saying, you know, in the good old days, that there was never a golden age, but there was more of a sense that journalism was a public service and that uh, we were there to be intermediaries between government and the public to try to get what we can from the government as much of what they were doing, what they were really doing, not just what they were telling reporters and just repeating that, but to really try to find out what's going on. And this this change, I see there's a certain vanity involved in the careerism of a lot of journalists who uh, want to be close to power, 
rather than critique power, that they don't understand the power of the media is far different than the power of government. I think it's uh, of a completely different kind. And I always was attracted to that power. I think it's more powerful if you can cut down the powerful people to size if they've done something wrong. That quality of thinking seems to be gone now. Am I wrong about that or not as strong as it used to be? I think you're absolutely right about it. Uh, And the difficulty, um, I think, for public broadcasting um, is that there was a change a couple of decades ago when um, we lost the, uh, the importance, we forgot about the importance of collective action and uh, the, the ideals that our, um, that our, you know, we embarked on, uh, that led us to embark on our career. But what happened was with this social change, um, change in employment conditions, uh, and, and people were put on very short-term contracts so, uh, and when you have a mortgage and you're on a short-term, con- on a three-month or six-month contract, you have to be, very, well, you're compelled to be very careful, very cool. And I think that's the way uh, media organisations control journalists and you find a lot of people uh, that were there for many years and with with a lot of experience um, either took redundancies or went into other areas or became freelance uh, and so the uh, unfortunately uh, the poor of people left uh, tend to be um, uh, uh, easily intimidated and, easily and that told. Mm. Yeah, that's at the lower levels and in the upper levels of this of our business. I recall a, a talk that the then president, the head of the Columbia Journalism School in New York, he pointed out one moment where particularly television news changed. Barbara Walters, I'm sure you know who she is. She was a pioneering female uh, broadcast as you were in Australia, but in the U.S. She was given a million dollar contract, the first million dollar contract sometime in the 19 late 70s or at some point and he said that that changed the landscape now uh tv journalists in the old days were came out of the wire services and newspapers guys like walter cronkite and dan rather here they all started at upi or ap they newsmen and newswomen and now uh they're tv stars they are personalities they play journalists on tv and they're paid huge bucks to uh, to to entertain, like the movie network uh, predicted that the entertainment division would take over the news division uh, at TV stations because to, it was always believed that the entertainment division would make a lot of money, so much money that they could support a losing news department, that the news division was not going to make money, but it had to be supported by entertainment because it was a public service. That's gone. It has to make money too. And then you've got these huge stars making incredible amounts of money to fool us on TV that they're really giving us journalism. It's a pretty sorry state right now. Yeah, well, the news departments became part of the entertainment division and then uh, decisions about what is newsworthy are obviously affected by that and decisions about who you have in the role of anchor and senior uh, correspondents is affected by that. Uh, so the emphasis is much more on uh, entertainment, really, than the, the sorts of um, uh, values that should underlie proper journalism. And governments sleep well at night with that situation. But stepping into the breach is WikiLeaks, coming out of nowhere, doing it even better than uh, serious journalists could do by getting the actual raw materials and documents sent, as you pointed out, ingeniously sent by whistleblowers in an anonymous way and um that's a big problem and that's why we're having these vigils because they want to get assange and they want to stop wikileaks um what could the public do in your opinion mary uh, if the media fails to try to support wikileaks continuing to do its work well, we need a bigger collective voice, and I'm particularly disappointed in the situation back here. Um, Australia is where he comes from, uh, and we need to improve 
or work on our uh, networks because when the crunch comes and we should be forcing that moment, we should be putting pressure on our government to negotiate um, for his uh, safe passage home. And uh, But then the problem when he gets here is, and I, I think that there's a mistaken belief uh, among supporters here that once in Australia he's going to be safe, and I don't think that's the case uh, because uh, we have an extradition treaty with the United States and um, I've been told by one of the major parties' elder statesmen that um, a government, an Australian government of any persuasion would be obliged to extradite him to the United States under the terms of our treaty. And, and when I put to this person, well, there will be protests, um, the response was, so be it. So you can see how uh, determined uh, they would be uh, and, and the sort of effort it would take here. Um, uh, I, I really am concerned about that. As I said, it's, it's one step to get him out of there and, and perhaps back here. Um, frankly, I think, you know, he'd be better off going to a country that's not likely to do that. Under the previous government of, of Ecuador, it would have been ideal to have safe passage uh, to Ecuador, but under the current conditions, that doesn't look like it would be much of a safe haven either. So it's it's a terrible situation. But yes, no. go ahead. I, I really think that um, you know gov governments though do listen to large numbers of people, and uh, it's really about the size of the response. Um, it's one thing to say, oh, we you know we won't worry about protests, but uh, you have to send a very very strong signal, and I think governments are concerned about not being uh, losing the confidence of voters on, on serious issues, perhaps particularly if, if that issue can be translated uh, to um, so that it captures the imagination of large numbers of people. Uh, unfortunately, um, many of us don't really understand how our democracy is undermined daily and, and the efforts uh, that, that um, uh, some people put into trying to ensure or trying to shore up our democracy. And we don't, unfortunately, you know, we, we perhaps don't understand until uh, we lose those, um, those rights and they're being undermined on a daily basis. Um, so, yes, I think the answer is uh, definitely to try and uh, shore up as much support back home as possible. Do you think uh, you're describing the kind of, um, you know, seam of envy amongst, um, you know, your colleagues at the time that WikiLeaks became prominent and, and started to, to publish? Do you think that the current, um, you know, lack of support and, you know, vitriol that's aimed at WikiLeaks from much of the establishment media is really a manifest, it's, you know, the manifestation of that envy that's been given an excuse to unleash itself because of the events of 2016? Uh, I, yes, look, I think there are various factors. The envy is one of them. Another is just it's easier not to have to deal with it and, and write them off as um, rat bags. And um, um, it's just that the unfortunate um, uh, effect of that is that it's the real issues aren't, you know, given enough airtime. The issues that are given airtime are ones of personality, so that they'll focus on Julian's personality or, or, or who they think he is, what, you know, the, the conclusions they come to about his personality. Uh, and it's much easier for them to deal with that than to deal with all of the material that um, is being released and all the potential investigative stories that could be uh, done. Uh, much easier to focus on him as a personality.
You know, the, the trouble with that is that then, you know, people may start making decisions about whose human rights are worth defending. So if you come to, the, to a conclusion about a person's personality and you think that they are they're a bit too big for their boots or they're a narcissist or, or you know, whatever conclusion you come to, uh, all of a sudden uh, the leap from that is that, oh, if we don't like someone, we don't defend their human rights. So uh, for me, it, it operates on so many levels. Firstly, it's um, the human rights of an individual. And, uh, but secondly, it's who, what that individual represents, the organisation. And, and in fact, the organisation is more than the one person. Uh, when I was in London some years ago, I had the privilege of meeting some of the people uh, behind WikiLeaks, and they are an extraordinary, um, highly intelligent, resourceful, dedicated, courageous uh, group of people. Um, and I think that all of that is not is discounted because of the focus on a, uh, the perceived personality of the founder. Yeah, and as, as you and Joe were discussing, it's as if, um, you know, in this shift from, um, I guess, you know, somewhat um, morally guided journalism to almost reality television entertainment, it, you know, issues that should be covered with a sense of depth um, are just reduced into tiny sound bites. And, and I think that's something that you're describing as, as affecting the coverage of Assange, which, you know, boils him down to a personality kind of cartoon as opposed to a discussion of the issues that matter around the case, for sure. Yes, unfortunately, that, that, that's uh, definitely the case. And I'm very pleased that I was involved in the media when I was and got out when I did because I don't think I would have, uh, it's, you know, it's not something that I could do at the moment. That's a huge shame. I'm so sorry. I, you know, it's it's one of those indictments against the entire industry. I guess that that you know people like yourself have been so directly kind of driven out, or you know that it's become an environment where it's impossible to work with a sense of integrity. Ah, oh, but there are other ways that you can um, contribute, and I think that that's very important. Um, fortunately, in today's digital world, it's uh, important to build. It's possible to build networks uh, and in fact I think people are congregating less around um, the traditional portals and our, our habits are changing you know we we get news now from Twitter it's the fastest way to inform let people know of something that's happening um, at, live so um, yeah, I, I think that um, it's it's not as bad as it sounds. I'm unfortunately though for those people that do congregate around the telly still and and watch the you know programs. Um, it I think it's a, a bit a little bit dismal. What can I say? Yeah, no, it, it is a depressing scene. Joe, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I was going to ask Mary if she has any views on what's going on with. Chelsea Manning. Oh, what a courageous human being. What a principled human being. She's just extraordinary. Um, the fact that she's prepared to do this, you know, she's already paid an enormous price. Uh, but it's such a, um, an important moment because it galvanises people. It makes you remember the importance of standing by your principles. And what she's doing really is highlighting the importance of WikiLeaks, saying, I'm sorry, this organisation is too important. You can't do this to the rest of us. Yeah. What kind of coverage is that getting in Australia? I just came from Australia two days ago, but I didn't see too much there, and it's not getting a hell of a lot here either in the U.S. now that I'm back here. No, it's, and, not, it, it, it's not getting a lot of coverage. It's not getting the coverage that it should get. Um, you mentioned uh, something. Uh, when, you, when you were talking about Chelsea earlier, uh, you know, it's really about trying to demonise uh, Julian Assange and and when 
um, for example, the release of the uh, DNC and uh, emails, uh, documents and Hillary's emails uh, occurred, the big issue, the big story was, ah, oh, they are influencing a US election by releasing these documents, when really it's, the, it's exactly the opposite. If you have that information, you are influenced then, and you withhold it. That's when you're trying to influence the US election. If you have this information, you are you have to release it so that Absolutely. it can be aware. Uh, and what they were, what they did to Bernie Sanders was extraordinary. Uh, and we wouldn't have known that if it wasn't for WikiLeaks. And legal, unfortunately, because they tried to sue, um, and the court did basically just said it was a private organization, and they can be as corrupt as they want to. They're not subject to uh, they're subject to their rules, not to the law, in a sense. Um, you know, there's a good example. Sorry, go ahead. As you say, no, but they're accountable to the U.S. public, and it was very, very important for the U.S. public to be aware of what happened and for the rest of us to be aware of what happened. Absolutely, you know, there's a, there is an example of where you, uh, you mentioned where by withholding the information you'd have an impact on the election. And that was the New York Times reporter, James Risen, who had learned before the, what was that? The 20, the 2006 election, Kerry Bush, that the US was violating the Fourth Amendment by warrantless wiretapping of American citizens on US territory totally against the law, against what the NSA used to teach their employees not to do, because what happened after 9-11, of course, was the president's program. So Risen had this story, and his Times editors sat on it. They did not publish before the election, fearing that it would have an impact on the election. Well, the voters need to know this. They're the ones who will make the decision about whether it impacts the election, not the newspaper. You just put it out there. And you cannot withhold it. And they did. And they would have continued to withhold it, except Risen was coming out with his own book and he was going to scoop his own newspaper. So they realized at that point they, they would look pretty silly if, the, if their reporter wrote it in a book and they didn't publish it. So they published it too late after the election. Yeah, I, I just can't, um, can't, couldn't possibly understand a journalist find and hold on to publishing that material um, because uh, it's really up, up to the public to decide um, you know, the impact that it's going to have on their decision. But you, uh, as you point out, this sort of thing happens a lot in media organisations. Uh, uh, journalists are under pressure to um, put off a story for, for whatever reason. Um, and uh, it, generally, in media organisations, uh, they have they, you know they they're not in control. Ultimately, they're not the editor, uh, so it's successful. In your organisation, in WikiLeaks, um, and and in in too few others, that's not the case. So uh, we were talking a little bit before about envy. Well. You know, imagine if you worked in a big media organisation and here was WikiLeaks doing what they, uh, you know, are able to do uh, and you have to be very, very cautious. And uh, so it's complicated. The, the, the mainstream media's uh, relationship to WikiLeaks is complicated. It operates on... There are multiple factors at work here. Um, so, um, yeah, it's, it's very disappointing, uh, what can I say? But we have to find a way to generate um, a bigger public voice and a bigger collective voice. Do you have any uh, advice for our, our, our listeners and viewers on how they can sort of empower themselves in order to raise their collective voices? Do you have any thoughts on what the average person listening can do? Yeah, I, I think in our, in our networks it's really uh, vital to um, inform people of the benefits uh, of, of what we've gained from WikiLeaks but also just 
to talk about, um, to raise awareness of what are the uh, public interest issues in democracy and maintaining the health of our democracy. Uh, I think that there's probably, uh, it's just a function of society today that we're more interested in um, our hip pocket and you know whether the um, upcoming election is going to mean that there are going to be tax breaks or no tax breaks and, and who's getting the tax breaks. There's, that seems to be uh, the emphasis and um, the focal point of interest. Fortunately, there's also a, a, a interest growing in climate change and more important issues like that. Um, but this, the importance of uh, freedom of information, uh, the importance of our access to that information uh, is, is being threatened and undermined all the time in ways that we uh, don't ne necessar aren't necessarily aware of. Um, and WikiLeaks is... Is a, is, a, is, is a warrior. It's a real David and Goliath metaphor. Um, and I think we need um, to have uh, institutions and people that we're proud of. And we have to be able to see that WikiLeaks is something that's homegrown, that's Australian in origin, and we can be proud of it and we can defend it. And I say that on a day when Australians are just um, astonished uh, because an Australian has been responsible for gunning down 40 people in, in a mosque in New Zealand. Um, there are enough reasons to be concerned about our society so, uh, and we have to be able to express that concern and to say, uh, this is not us. This is something we are deeply mortified at, uh, ashamed at. Um, and equally, we have to have the courage to say, but we are very proud of this because this little organisation is providing a service to democracy, not just for us, but for people around the world. Because if you look at the... The, the stories that have emanated from the information that WikiLeaks has provided. Um, it just goes on and on, including Venezuela uh, and, and the, the whole issue around the power grid in Venezuela and the interest that the US has um, had in that for a very long time. So um, we have to be able to see this as something that we are very proud of and are prepared to defend and, and to say to our politicians, you really need to stand up um, uh, for this person and for this organisation. They seem to lack the courage to do that. They'd much rather just follow American dictates for whatever reasons. And this is a huge problem in Australia, isn't it? Well, lack of sovereignty. Is. Lack of sovereignty. It is. We've allied ourselves with the US on, on so many big issues. We've gone into war with them. Uh, and, and these are wars that are prosecuted in our name. Uh, and um, WikiLeaks is really in the end, the only way that we've been able to find out some critical information about um, that, that, that war and, and the reasons for that war. Um, I think little New Zealand has been more courageous um, uh, and we have to watch that closely because uh, it's leaders like... Um, Arden, who can capture the public imagination, because what she's saying is that being ethical, both as a human being and, and, and as an institution, we want our democracy, our parliament to be ethical, to, to fulfil our responsibility to the citizens of this country. And it's important for us to see that that model is possible. Uh, I'm not saying that 
you know, she's necessarily perfect um, and the New, that the New Zealand government is perfect. But we need to be able to um, uh, promote people into our parliament uh, who have got the right values. Um, because as you say, unfortunately, it's really about people who can sell, you know, very short messages that are, have very little substance uh, and, and often will um, uh, encourage xenophobia and hatred towards uh, minority groups. Uh, and what we need is someone who can capture the public imagination and say, look, we're really uh, the most important thing is our humanity and how we behave towards each other and how countries behave towards each other. Because one of the tools that's used constantly is this issue of the national interest and what's in the national interest. Well, it's not in the national interest if we generate, if we disempower people in another part of the world and, and if we generate hatred uh, by ensuring that uh, they're robbed of their natural resources or, you know, many of them are killed in wars that are really ultimately about resources. Uh, that's not in our public interest and it's not in the interest of global peace uh, because you can't have um, a peace without justice. Um, that's been a major theme of a foundation at um, which I chaired for a little while and, and which gave, um, awarded uh, Julian Assange a gold medal for peace uh, some years ago before he went into the Ecuadorian embassy. Um, that's what, they're, they're the things that should be uniting us. And uh, unfortunately, we're waylaid by people who uh, are selling very, very different messages. But I'm encouraged um, in Australia by uh, some change on, on, um, in the political uh, arena. We've got um, some interesting candidates coming up uh, in, in this federal election, including Julian Burnside, who has acted um, for Julian Assange. And he's standing for the Greens. And, um, of course, there are all sorts of smear campaigns against him. Um, but um, I think he's going to, well, I'm hoping he will win against uh, the current treasurer, uh, the seat of Kuyong. Um, but even if he doesn't, in the meanwhile, in the meantime, he's generating a lot of public discourse around uh, what, what is fundamentally important in politics, what is fundamentally important in society. And we need more of that. Um, and, and I think other candidates, um, such as the um, young woman who is running against uh, our former Prime Minister Tony Abbott in his seat. This, this is starting to happen here uh, in a bigger way than it has in the past. So there is a cause for some, um, some hope. Uh, there are some encouraging signs. And, and really those signs are about... Um, positive forces in society that are engaging the public imagination and saying, this, I'm normal, I'm human, and I want to be, uh, I want to represent you in parliament. This is what I stand for. Um, and these are the values and values that we can be um, proud of, I think. And no courageous judge in an extradition court in Australia could say these charges against Assange, they, they don't amount to very much. He's a publisher. And you, can't, you can't have him arrested on that. You don't think there's one judge in, in Australia who could deny extradition to the U.S.? I think there's, there's some important work to be done here um, because there are lawyers who um, uh, our experts in these international treaties and we certainly need to be working with them uh, to prepare for that eventuality. Um, that, that's a, a very important aspect of what needs to be happening right now.
Um, because I think in the end, you know, judges have to um, interpret the law and if the law is fairly black and white, uh, you know, I think that the outcome is going to be predictable. 